Welcome to Hear the Word of God, the online and broadcast teaching ministry of the Rev. Eric Alexander. Well, this sermon of Isaiah's, as I was saying, is not so much addressed as we have found most of the others have been addressed to individual nations or particular groups of people. It is addressed to a spiritual condition. And the spiritual condition is described in verse 1 of chapter 30. It meets us right at the very beginning, and it's the title of the chapter, or the first part of it at least in the NIV, Woe to the Obstinate Nation. So the spiritual condition to which this chapter, the sermon of Isaiah, and you can see it's a sermon, can't you, with some of this illustrative material, like a wall that's bulging, and you can just imagine how in Isaiah's language the wall was apparently bulging until it collapsed upon the people. He has got so many um, sermonic habits in these parts of Isaiah. It's full of vivid language and illustration. But at the very beginning, he introduces us to this whole theme of obstinacy. It is a spiritual stubbornness. It is what we would have called in Scotland spiritual thrawnness. That kind of condition which makes people dig their feet in against God, as it were. That is, they have set their hearts on something. They have set their minds on doing something, and they will not be budged even by the Spirit of God. Its language is, we shall not be moved. We have made up our mind, and we are going our own way. It is a childish thing in some ways, and you will notice how right at the beginning it is of obstinate children that Isaiah speaks. Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord. And you will know how sometimes children get into that condition where they screw up their face and say, no, I won't. And there is this deep seated obstinacy, a refusal to turn from their own way. And Isaiah describes it to us. It's the condition of rebelliousness which Israel was so often in when they refuse to listen to God's voice. It's the kind of thing Jesus is speaking about in that parable where he describes how the master of the vineyard and the owner sent so many of his servants one after the other and they refused to listen to them. There was the spirit of obstinacy there. Now it's this condition that Isaiah is preaching about and he has five things to say about it. That's a good Calvinistic number for uh, a prophet, and he has five things to say. The first of these is this. He describes its nature. You find that in many parts of the chapter, of course, but perhaps principally in verses 1 and 2, 9 to 11, and 15 at the end. And there are certain things, do you notice, that Isaiah tells us about the spiritual condition. And it's immensely important for us to take this up and apply it to our own lives because he is speaking about something that's not just true of ancient Judah. It's true in the modern Christian church. The description of it begins by telling us that this spirit of obstinacy is characterized by making all our own plans while leaving God out of consideration. Now, that's one of its primary characteristics. And before you go on and say, well, that's quite a dreadful thing to do, let me tell you that this is one of the evidences, not of theoretical atheism. None of us here this evening would be theoretical atheists. But it is possible to be a practical atheist. 
by making all your plans and leaving God out of consideration, or by making all your plans and then seeking to employ God to bless them after you've made them. You know the kind of thing. I can detect from smiles here and there that you know exactly what I'm talking about because it's something that it's so easy for us to do. And it's the kind of thing that Isaiah's referring to when he says in verse 1, Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance, but not by my Spirit. We need to pause there for just a moment. Do you mind if I become personal and... Uh, recollective and anecdotal and that sort of thing. You know they say there are several ages through which people pass. There is age and old age and dotage and anecdotage. And the anecdotage is when the old person is telling you all about their past. Let me tell you how I think this very lesson came home to me for the first time in my life before I was a Christian. And I was uh, living in a home where the only truly converted Christian was my brother, who had come back from the army, having been brought to faith in Christ, and uh, we found him a somewhat strange phenomenon. And there was a major decision being taken in the household at the time. We were planning to move house. And I can still remember the strange experience when my brother had not taken part in much of the discussion and nothing else had been discussed really at our table lunchtime and in the evening too for some considerable period of time. And uncharacteristically, he had been very silent. And then, on one occasion, when we were coming near to what I suppose would have been the crunch, he said, Have you ever asked, looking at my father, whether this is something God means you to do? Now that was an issue that had never been raised in my mind before and certainly never in my family before. And I remember being thoroughly displeased with him. I said to him, it's a house we're buying, not a church or something of the kind. It's got nothing to do with religion. And he said, well, the only way this thing will prosper is if it is God's plan and not just ours. And I will never forget being brought as a family to God in prayer by my brother. It had never happened before. We hadn't been really very interested in God's opinion of the whole thing. But it was one of the crucial turning points in my own life and I think also in my parents. But you know, it's such an easy thing for us as Christians, professing a great deal, having matured over a number of years. Is this where we begin? Do our plans begin by seeking the mind and the purpose of God? Because that's what Isaiah is speaking about. The spirit of obstinacy is a spirit that plans without God. Forming an alliance, in the case of Judah, with Assyria, as we have found earlier, but not by my spirit, says God. So it is making all your plans while leaving God out of consideration. And thereby, notice that interesting little phrase at the end of verse 1, heaping sin 
upon sin because, of course, once you step outside of the will of God and go your own way, that's just the beginning of heaping sin upon sin. So you go down to Egypt, verse 2, without consulting me. The second thing Isaiah tells us is that this spirit of obstinacy is putting your confidence in other objects than God and refusing his wisdom and his help. Look at verse 2. Who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. Now it was one of the great ways in which the psalmist spoke of God that they dwelt under his shadow. Do you remember Psalm 91 where the psalmist says, in the secret place of the Most High, under the shadow of the Almighty, that is where he has his dwelling. It's the whole principle of the person out in the Middle East beneath the blazing sun, and he finds shade under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, do you notice what Isaiah is saying? You have replaced the Almighty with Egypt. Notice, you've gone down to Egypt without consulting me. You look to Pharaoh for help and protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. So they have substituted Egypt for God. And of course, that is a penetratingly modern thing for us to do. What is the alternative to God? Where do we look for assistance? Where is our eye instinctively turned to when we discover our own weakness and frailty and need and our humanness? Says Isaiah, in your case, you have substituted Egypt for God. So it's putting your confidence in other things than God and refusing his wisdom, his grace, his help, and refusing to acknowledge your dependence upon him. Keep applying that, won't you, to all sorts of different things in your own life. Notice the third thing. It is refusing God's instruction. If you turn over to verse 9... These are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. And being unwilling to hear whatever is uncomfortable or disagreeable for us. Notice verse 10. So the Spirit, this obstinate spirit is unteachable, unwilling to be instructed and to hear what the Lord is saying. Therefore, of course, it derives from a certain attitude to the Word of God. But notice what it says. It refuses to be disturbed. It refuses to listen to what is disagreeable. If I have decided that I don't agree with this, then I will not listen. They say to the seers, See no more visions, because the visions you see, we don't like them. And to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Then tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way. Get off this path. And stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. Isn't that an extraordinary thing for people to say? These are God's people, mind you. Stop confronting us, they say, with the Holy One of Israel. Can you imagine that they see Isaiah coming along the path, as it were, and they say, get off the path, clear away from us. Here he comes again with the Holy One of Israel, which was Isaiah's favorite way of speaking about God. And they say, don't prophesy these visions to the seers, see no more. We don't want to listen. 
Now this spiritual condition therefore begins in the heart with a preference for my own will over God's. It develops in the mind by a refusal of God's instruction and it ends up in the realm of behavior and in disobedience to God's will. We lay our plans, we are going to go down to Egypt for assistance, and that begins to develop in our minds. Then whenever God speaks to us to correct us, we refuse to hear. Now that's a point which is of enormous importance. Whenever God says something to correct me, Am I teachable at that point? That's the real issue. Or am I obstinate when God is wanting to speak to me about something? And then it ends up in the situation where we go our own way and refuse to hear God's voice. Earlier on in one of these sermons we discovered that when you refuse to listen to what God is saying, you become deaf to God's voice. And that's the seriousness of the Spirit. So that's the first thing. He explains the nature of the spiritual condition. The second thing is he exposes the folly of it in verses 3 to 7. And you will notice that what he is really describing is how stupid these people are. Folly here really means just crass stupidity for turning away from God and refusing his voice and carving out our own plans and going our own way is always, always the way of the fool. You see, Egypt's greatness was now in the past. At one time... Egypt might have been a power in which Judah should have trusted because of their great might. They could perhaps in a former day have delivered what they seemed able to promise. But now Egypt was a spent force and Egypt could not deliver what it promised. And so trusting in Egypt was one of the most stupid things that Judah could have done. Notice how Isaiah describes it. Verse 3, but Pharaoh's protection will be to your shame. Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. Though they have officials in Zoan and their envoys have arrived in Hanes, which is probably short for Tachpanes, it's an area around uh, the delta of the Nile. Everyone will be put to shame because of a people useless to them, notice, who bring neither help nor advantage, but only shame and disgrace. And now he brings an illustration out of this. And verses 6 and 7 are really this kind of vivid expression that Isaiah has. What he's really picturing is a, a group of people coming with great wealth, gathering their wealth with them, taking a very dangerous journey down the Negev, that is the the border of Palestine. And they take this journey down towards Egypt. And they do so through a country that's full of wild beasts and dangerous animals of all kinds. And they do so, of course, because at the end of it, they're expecting utopia. And what do they get? A weak, sickly power in a bigger mess than they are, which can deliver nothing. Listen to how Isaiah puts it. An oracle, verse 6, concerning the animals of the Negev, that's that strip of ground through which they're passing, through a land of hardship and distress, of lions and lionesses, of adders and darting snakes, the envoys carry their riches on donkeys' backs, their treasures on the humps of camels, to that unprofitable nation, to Egypt, whose help is utterly useless. Therefore, I call her, and Philip, as you may recollect, 
says, I call her a spent whirlwind. The NIV says, Rahab the do-nothing. Now that Rahab has nothing to do with Rahab, uh, who was uh, the harlot whom Joshua and uh, the others agreed to uh, a plan with. That this Rahab is really the name of a kind of fearsome monster uh, in ancient thinking. But really the translation of Phillips is better. This is why I call her the spent whirlwind or the dragon that can do nothing with its teeth drawn or whatever. So he is describing to them the folly of the spirit of refusing God. They have landed up with ashes instead of glory. That, of course, in the long term is so often the tragic result of resisting God, isn't it? We so often find that that's true that in the long term the result of an obstinate spirit is that you've grasped for something that was great and it was just a dream. Or as Alexander McLaren used to say, they have gone after this multicolored bubble and when they grasped it, it was just a drop of dirty water. And that's so often the experience that Isaiah is highlighting here for us, the folly of the Spirit. Thirdly, he warns of the disastrous results of it. And this is a word directly from God, you will notice in verse 12, for example. Therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message, relied on oppression and depended on deceit, this sin will become for you like a high wall cracked and bulging that collapses suddenly in an instant. In other words, the problem with a spirit that is all wrong like this, whatever it may be, is that it does not have an immediate judgment. Notice Isaiah's picture. It's the picture of a wall that's bulging. If you've ever had a great stone wall around your garden or somewhere, we used to have one in New Mills, and I remember seeing it gradually bulging out towards the road and telling the fabric committee in the church, There's, something's going to happen to that wall sometime. When the frost came... Uh, it began to retract a little, but then when the thaw came, suddenly the wall spilled out onto the road. It's this kind of thing he's speaking of. You know, there was a disaster in France years ago, which hit the headlines at the time. It was a great reservoir of way up in the hills in central France, where the water suddenly one day cast Caded down in millions of tons upon two villages. And people wondered, whatever was this that had happened with this sudden disaster? But they found it hadn't really been a sudden disaster. What had been happening was that the concrete was being eroded gradually. It took years for it to happen, and nothing public took place, but it was gradually being eroded away, and something was eating at the very vitals of this retaining wall for the dam until the day came when it broke right through. But the trouble began, you see, years before. And sometimes when we refuse to listen to God, when he's touching us about something that perhaps we would rather he didn't if the truth were told, is stay away and talk to us no more about the Holy One of Israel. That can sometimes be the point where 
long-term trouble begins. Spiritually, I mean. And this was the disastrous result of which God is speaking here. Now let me go on to the fourth thing, which is the glorious thing, and that's the divine cure for it. Notice in verse 15, the very first word that God speaks is a word about repentance. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel, says, verse 15. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. That is, there is a returning that is going to be needed. In some translations it is, in returning and rest is your salvation. In quietness and confidence is your strength. But what Isaiah is saying from God, he says, the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says this, there needs to be a radical change. There needs to be a radical turning and a radical breaking of the spirit of obstinacy so that you return to find your rest in the Lord. Now that repentance may be what is further detailed in verses like verse 22. Then you will defile your idols overlaid with silver and your images covered with gold. You will throw them away like a menstrual cloth and say to them, away with you. Now you notice how radical this is. He says the idols, that's the thing. The things that have replaced God, they will need to come down. I remember David and Adele Ellis telling me when I was in Indonesia. There were so many professions that people would make in various parts of Java, you know. There would be a response to the gospel. But the important thing in every life and every home was what they did with the idle things on the mantelpiece. What happened to them, that was the vital thing. And the day you went in and found that they had taken the idols and cast them down, that was the moment of divine victory. Now that's what Isaiah is speaking about. You will defile your idols overlaid with silver and your images covered with gold. You will throw them away, away with you. This is radical repentance. And in quiet confidence in God, that's the new attitude. You see, repentance is not just a negative thing. It's not just a case of turning away from something. It's a case of turning to something. And what we turn to is a quiet confidence in God. It's an interesting expression, isn't it? Instead of the frenzy of planning my own way and trying to discover the right way for self-advancement and so on, there is this quiet, confident trust in the Sovereign Lord. Now, notice in verse 15b to 17, uh, whereas this is the cure... At the very end of verse 15, Isaiah says from God, But you would have none of it. You said, No, we will flee on horses. Um, Phillips has a better translation. No, we must have horses to ride. Very well, God says, you shall ride in full retreat. We must have swift horses, you say. Your pursuers will be swifter than you. A thousand, verse 17, will flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, you will all flee away till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountain top, like a banner on a hill. And this is the terrible thing. When God is prescribing the remedy, they say, no, thank you. But like the doctor, you know, when you've gone with some desperate illness, and the doctor says to you, now, here's the cure. Repentance and returning and a quiet confidence in God. And you say, thanks all the same, but I won't be taking it. And that's what they were saying to God. 
thanks all the same very interesting but I'll do without it you would have none of it but notice the root of the divine cure is not in advice nor in preaching or teaching the root of the divine cure is in divine grace verse 18 yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you he arises to show you compassion now there's the father of the prodigal son right in the heart of the Old Testament isn't it he arises longing to show you compassion. Can you imagine this? Well, of course you can, even at the human level, with obstinate children. I don't know anything about obstinate children from personal experience. I'd better add that quickly. But you will realize that uh, this is something that parents, even at the human level, know a great deal about. They long to have love and kindness and care even when their children are being obstinate and difficult now you need to multiply that by infinity to come to the borders of the grace of God that Jesus is speaking about in the son the father of that prodigal son who is rising up day after day waiting to welcome this bedraggled character home and Isaiah says the Lord longs to be gracious he rises to show you compassion for the Lord is a God of justice blessed are all who wait for him and his justice is seen in his mercy that's what the cross of course is all about Verse 19, O people of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. How gracious he will be when you cry for help. Do you notice so many of these amazing things? There is indeed a pattern because our time is going. Let me just give you the heads of this pattern of God's cure. It is repentance and a new kind of confidence in God. It is prayerfulness and a new kind of crying to God, verse 19. The Lord is a God of justice. O oh, people of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. How gracious he will be when you cry for help. It is prayerfulness then and a new kind of crying to God. Notice thirdly, it's instruction. This is God's way of cure. It's instruction in verses 20 and 21 and a new kind of obedience to God. Verse 20, although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers, it might be singular teacher, and it could be referring to God rather than to the prophets. Your teacher will be hidden no more. With your own eyes you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, now this is the teaching ministry, you see. This is the way. Walk in it. And then you will defile your idols overlaid with silver and throw them away. So it's instruction and a new kind of obedience to God. And then in verses 23 to 26, it is restoration and a new kind of joy in God. He will also send you rain for your seed, verse 23, that you sow in the ground, and food that comes from the land will be rich and plentiful. Here is the picture, you see. Everything that Egypt couldn't deliver, God does. Isn't that glorious? And how stupid it is for us to put our confidence and our trust somewhere else when there is nothing to be gained by going our own way, going after our own plans. God has everything for his children. And he is waiting to be gracious and longing to pour out from that rich barn of his goodness everything that his children need. If we will go his way, you see it? The way of repentance, the way of prayerfulness, the way of instruction, the way of restoration. And finally, in verses 27 to 33, verses that scarcely need any comment, 
there is the final judgment of God upon the source of the Spirit. Now, undoubtedly, the people of God had been infected from other nations round about with confidence in Egypt. The way the world did it was to ally with Assyria. You looked for a stronger nation. You trusted them, and they were infected by that spirit. Now, what verses 27 to 33 uh, speak about is how God is going to come down in judgment upon the source of that spirit. The final act in that drama is actually written in Revelation chapter 19, where you find God's ultimate triumph over evil. And just as here, did you notice when we were reading, there is a spirit of joy and rejoicing in Revelation chapter 19. We read, um, Praise our God, all you his servants who fear him, both small and great. This is the voice that came from the throne when God sent out his power in judgment. He has condemned the great prostitute. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. That's the ultimate triumph of God over evil. And Isaiah 30 verses 27 to 33 is in a sense a forecast as well as a preview of that. The great issue, of course, is the spirit that Isaiah has been speaking about and the God of grace, the God of infinite tenderness and unspeakable mercy who all the day long stretches out his hands to his people to get them to go God's way. And the great thing is whether we're saying to him, we will have none of it. Or whether we re-echo words that went up into the universe from the lips of Jesus. And it's the very opposite of the obstinate spirit. Not my will, but yours be done. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for the way it comes to penetrate our hearts, but most of all, we thank you that it comes to heal them. And we bless you that you really are a God of such grace that you long to pour water on the thirsty ground and to heal the wounds that your word has made. Oh, come and bless us with that spirit of Jesus to master our lives this evening. And may his grace and mercy and peace be our portion now and forevermore. Amen. You're listening to Hear the Word of God with the Rev. Eric Alexander, a minister in the Church of Scotland for over 50 years. To access more Bible teaching from Rev. Alexander, visit hearthewordofgod.org, where your generous contribution will help us sustain and grow this ministry. That's hearthewordofgod.org. You could choose instead to mail a check to this address, 600 Eden Road, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 17601, or call 1-800-488-1888. This program is a presentation of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. I'm Mark Daniels. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next time for Eric Alexander and Hear the Word of God.